All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome welcome to Monday. Welcome to May. Rise and grind, people. Today is Monday, May 1st, 2023. Welcome to episode number 356. <laughs> wow. Of the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Brief. And I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Osher. And over the next 45 minutes, me, you, Marcus Seiler, Wayne's Real World, Soul Shine, Jordan Turney, Abdullah, Josh Mason, all the mods, and you will be going through the top cybersecurity news stories of the day, and I'll be giving my expert opinion and analysis on each of those stories on what it means to you as a practitioner, or if you're looking to break into the industry, there's going to be value here for you, I guarantee you. So sit down, settle in, and get ready to tear the top off the top news of the day. It's going to be a good time, but before we get into that, I do want to say shout out and thanks to the stream sponsors. You guys know them, some of them longtime stream sponsors, including... My good friend Eric Taylor over at Barricade Cyber Solutions. If you're a squad member, there is an emote for you there. So giddy up on that. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business own owners into turmoil. But Barricade Cyber Solutions knows how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. They know how to take that shell shock looked off your face and make you feel like you're actually back in the back in the pilot seat, back in control, not like, you know, you're not like the F-16 in the original Top Gun when Goose and uh, Maverick get caught up in that jet wash and then it starts pancake spinning sideways before they uh, eject uh, poorly and then Goose, you know, we all know how it happens. You don't want to be the pancake flying F-16, right? You want to be the, the one at the end where it's like just going straight hard gas all over the place that's the f-16 you want <laughs> call barricade cyber solutions they can make that metaphor happen for your business i guarantee you check them out barricadecyber.com link in the description below okay f-14 air force at least i was close i was off by two <laughs> also want to say shout out and thanks to panopsi security for their support Panopsi Security uh, delivering all sorts of value to different businesses, but what they can do for you is give you a quantified risk assessment. So here's the thing. If you're putting your budget together for the um, fiscal year that starts in July, hopefully you already have it, but if you're still putting it together and you're like, oh my God, where do I invest my resources? Where do I put my dollars? Uh, I'll just throw them at this you know, tool or this, this uh, practice or whatever. And you know you don't really know if you're actually reducing cyber risk. That's a problem. A quantified risk assessment by Panopsi Security can actually inform you exactly what your current risk posture is and where different types of investments, what those investments will do from a cyber risk reduction perspective using uh, percentages, right? So if you invest in this, you'll, you'll reduce your chance of ransomware by 12%. If you invest in this, you can reduce your chances of business email compromise by 14%. Whatever it is, it gives you a much more uh, informed understanding of where your risks are and how you can uh, invest to protect from those risks. So consider Panopsi Security if you're uh, basically at the spot. Actually, if you don't even have a cybersecurity program and you're just like, you know, all over the place, like a hot mess on fire, might be a good time for a quantified risk assessment as well. Also, shout out to XM Cyber, but more about them at the mid-roll. If you're here with us live, lo oh wait, hold on, I got the, um, I got the little, the little thing scrolling across the bottom. There we go. We don't need that. That was a, that was a, uh, what do they call that? Oh my God, what do they call that? That was a uh, echo, if you will, or vestigial from uh, the Friday Simply CyberCon live stream. If you guys want to hear about that, ask me at the Jaw Jackie, and I'll be happy to dig into that. If you're live, I see 138 of you on this beautiful Monday morning. Welcome. Hit Team Live in chat if you're interested. If you are watching on replay, hello from the, from the past. Hashtag Team Replay in the comments. Uh, really do love engaging with all of you. Some of you are regular team replay uh, consumers, and I, I know you. I see you out there. Uh, love to have you there. If you're getting caught up, Team Hybrid. I saw Pursuit of Bliss was Team Hybrid. 
If you start late and you're doing 2x to get caught up to us live, your your hashtag team hybrid. I know you're, you're a uh, a smaller faction of the Simply Cyber community, but you are you do matter and you are people too. Uh, and finally, my favorite hashtag passive observer. This is all bundled into the Simply Cyber community challenge. If you are shy, if you are introverted, if you are imposter syndrome, if you are shy and don't want to say hello, but you realize how valuable networking is, drop a hashtag passive observer in chat and uh, just watch the Simply Cyber community uh, virtually give you a hug and welcome you and hopefully break the uh, break the ice, if you will, on being engaged in the community, in the chat. And uh, long long term, it will help you. Chocobobo knows what's up. Passive Observer, good to see you. What's up, Peter Lee? Good to see you. Remember, each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing is worth half a CPE if you need those for your certifications. Check your policies uh, for your certification body, but I feel pretty strongly I have a case for ISACA, ISC squared. Those are the two that I had checked uh, at the time. So take a screenshot, whatever you want to do uh, to get evidence that you were here. But you're here, and it's awesome. It is Monday, Art uh, Callan's Art of the Week. Callan did not submit artwork, so he uh, is going to get a demerit. <laughs> but I do have a art-related uh, aspect for the mid-roll, so look forward to that. Guys, it's that time. Sit back, relax. I'm glad you're here. We're going to have a great show. Let's sit back and let the cool sounds of the top cyber news wash over us in an awesome way. See you guys at the mid-roll. From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. Oh, and also, I, I want to start reminding people this. I have not heard these stories. I have not seen these stories until right now. So this is my honest, uh, in-the-moment feedback. Jimmy Dang dropping a super chat. Jimmy! What? Did we just become best friends? Yep! Dude, look at this guy! Six figures, no big deal. Compliance manager, no big deal. Crushing it, Jimmy! My man! Yes! This is what we're talking about. Congratulations, Jimmy. Super pumped for you. It's Monday, May 1st, 2023. Hackers target vulnerable Veeam backup servers exposed online. Malicious activity and tools echoing Fin7 attacks have been observed in intrusions since March 28th, less than a week after an exploit became available for a high-severity vulnerability in Veeam backup and replication software. Tracked as CVE 2023-27532, the security issue exposes encrypted credentials stored in the VBR configuration to unauthenticated users in the backup infrastructure. This could be used to access the backup infrastructure hosts. The software vendor fixed the issue on March 7th and provided workaround instructions. Threat researchers at Finnish cybersecurity and privacy company With Secure noted in a report this week that the tactics, techniques, and procedures were similar to activity previously attributed to Fin7. All right, so this isn't good. Um, I'm just looking at the actual advisory to see. I'm kind of curious when it was released. March... Here we are. Okay. <clears throat> um, Jesus. This stinks. Okay, so check it out. <clears throat> uh, Veeam, back <clears throat> Veeam backup servers are being exposed and compromised. Now, Veeam as a service is a really good service. I've worked in environments that have it. I think it's a really uh, snazzy service. Now, here's the problem. You are allowed to make an unauthenticated request to... Uh, these Veeam servers and get uh, encrypted credentials. Now, what does that mean? That means if these things are online and anyone can touch them, then they can get access to the server. And you might be like, oh no, my backups, that's not good. Ransomware actors are going to do ransomware stuff. Yes, that could happen. But the point is, and you can see it here. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to zoom in enough. You, you can, oh my gosh, I can't really zoom in enough. Um, the 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 uh the rub here can i do this nope picture doesn't get any bigger y'all here's the deal once you get on the server you now can execute under system credentials and that's what this graphic is showing it shows you get onto the box and then you're exec they're executing powershell uh you know basically they're popping a shell and running powershell from it 
and you can see that they're downloading something, a PowerShell script from some uh, um, threat actor controlled server. Yes, I, okay, so BSEC's in, they would have to be exposed to the internet for a compromised app and or already uh, compromised. I agree 100%. And there's probably some good reason in some capacity for them to be exposed to the internet in some capacities. I don't know what they are, but if you have to expose it to the internet, then you gotta you have to patch it. That's the only option, um, or just not expose it to the internet. I can't. I the only reason I could see having this service exposed to the internet is, it, I guess, if you were going to recover in some capacity from like multiple locations or something like that. But the problem is, it should be on a VPN. It shouldn't just be like raw, naked to the internet. Uh, in my opinion, so. But but the point is, what I want to tell you is, Fin Seven is a very legit. Uh, threat actor group. They used to be known, uh, I think the Cara Bank uh, malware strain, they were hitting banks left, right, and center. They were hardcore. Fin7 was scary business. And then Fin7 like found out about ransomware and they were like, oh, indubitably. And then they went full ransomware and then they just turned into another one of these like ransomware, um, you know, threat actor groups. Uh, this CVE 2023-27532, I just checked, came out. It was released by the vendor on March 1st, which means you had about four weeks, uh, excuse me, eight weeks to patch. This right here shows how important patch management is and being current with your patches. Yes, I know it's overwhelming. I know you can get um, remediation fatigue, okay? But this is bad and this is like like you gosh it's your, i mean even if it wasn't getting exploited and then uh taken advantage of the way it's being done in this story having your backup servers um not up to date not secure open to the internet um that's really bad especially because backup servers are typically part of your ransomware um risk reduction strategies and and R ransomware is so rampant that you need a specific ransomware um protection and uh and recovery uh, service, uh, not services, um, like a plan or processes, and Veeam would be part of that. So not good. Um, yeah, there's more information here if you want. You should absolutely take it as a um, an action item if you're running Veeam in your environment to make sure A, that it's not exposed to the internet, and B, that you guys have applied this patch because it's actively being compromised. Um, it's actively being exploited in the wild. The only other thing I would say to this too is, um, and I, I mentioned this from time to time on the channel. Turn the podcast up a little bit. All right, hold on one second. Okay, um, I do say this from time to time. Shodan Monitor, okay? Shodan.io, it, it still blows my mind that some people haven't heard about Shodan.io when I tell people about it. Shodan.io is like the search engine for the internet, okay? It's a wicked powerful OSINT tool. But right here, you see this thing at the top, monitor? Shodan monitor can allow you to put in your own external IP ranges. So your home, range, your home IP address if you really want. But like really, if you're a business and you have a stack of IP range, uh, uh, public facing IPs, you can put them in here and show them will proactively monitor them. And then when they see stuff, they'll email you and, or they'll notify you however you configure it. I do email, but, um, and it'll say, hey, you've got this thing here. So having Veeam exposed to the internet, show them would see it and it, you would know. Okay, so don't guess what your situation is. Know what your situation is. And show them monitors wicked cheap too, right? Like I'm not, I'm not like throwing money around, but like I think 50 bucks a year and you can get like, a pretty large set of IPs. Like I think they do it by like um, amount of IPs. I was doing an organization that had something like 30 IPs and I think I was paying 50 bucks a year or something like that. So, and, and we weren't even scratching um, the threshold of that tier. So anyways, be mindful. The DOJ detected the solar winds hack six months earlier than first disclosed. Kim Zetter, writing in Wired, states that the U.S. Department of Justice, Mandiant, and Microsoft stumbled upon the SolarWinds breach six months earlier than previously reported, but were unaware of its significance. Suspicions were triggered when the department detected unusual traffic emanating from one of its servers that was running a trial version of the Orion software suite made by SolarWinds. This according to sources familiar with the incident.
Investigators reached out to SolarWinds to assist with the inquiry, but the company's engineers were unable to find a vulnerability in their code. In August 2020, the DOJ purchased the Orion system, suggesting that the department was satisfied that there was no further threat posed by the Orion suite. What? Cold st What? Okay, 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 okay. A couple of things here. A couple of things here. One, the, I, I, I need to talk to like Eric Capuano about this right here and get his take on this. Okay, so SolarWinds, arguably the biggest hack in history, all right? And I, and I don't say that flippantly. I really, I, I really, I really mean it, okay? So TLDR, if you don't know about SolarWinds, okay? Russia, I'm, I'm like, I'm not even going to say allegedly. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm like, well, I guess I'll say allegedly because I'm 99% sure um, that it's been attributed to Russia. but. Allegedly, Russia hacked in to a developer at SolarWin into the, the developer's accounts, <clears throat> monitored how the developer wrote code, then started writing code as the developer, like in clear text, not obfuscated, not in Russian Cyrillic, writing code like the developer, and then committing the code into the code base, having it go through the DevOps pipeline, right? QC, QA, the works. And then, you know, obviously Russia had a copy of SolarWinds and then they would, they would look at the final version, like the production version and see the changes that they were making showing up in production. So they knew they could get into the pipeline. And then they started introducing backdoors and, you know, espionage capabilities. And it literally propagated through all of SolarWinds. And SolarWinds is all up in Fortune 500 companies, um, United States federal government instances. Okay, so it was a really nasty thing. And like famously, uh, the password for the account that was originally popped was SolarWinds123. And it was blamed on um, uh, on an intern, okay? Which was like less less of a classy move by the CEO of SolarWinds, but they that's what they did. They threw an intern under the bus. Okay, so the DOJ detects it because... Um, Russia's kind of snooping around and everything. And then they, they send it to SolarWinds and say, hey, something's funky here. And SolarWinds says, we don't find any vulnerabilities. First of all, what are you talking about? We don't find any vulnerabilities. Like the SolarWinds code base is probably huge. That's why we have bug bounty programs because you can't hire enough security researchers to analyze all your code base, right? Second of all, you can't, you can't prove a negative. You can't say there's no vulnerabilities. There is. It is absolutely vulnerabilities. You couldn't find them. Third, it doesn't even matter if they were able to discover zero vulnerabilities, which they can't. The Russians did not exploit a vulnerability. Well, I mean, they exploited a, the vulnerability of a human. They literally were writing code and committing code into production following policy and procedure of solar winds. They were there was not some technical zero day leet hacksaw. They were literally, some, some poor Russian guy had to like work as a software developer at, at SolarWinds effectively. He was doing it remotely, obviously, but like he had to like pretend to be a developer and commit code for a while before they were able to like feel confident that they could start introducing um, espionage type capabilities. Fourth, fourth thing, and this is just from my old uh, software engineering days, dude, if I give you three lines of code, right? Like three lines of code, I give it to Reggie Davis. Thank you, Reggie. And I'm like, hey, I wrote this code. Check it out. Three lines. You can look at it and go, yes, that does what it's supposed to do or no, that's not right. But if I give you 500 lines of code, bro, you're going to skim it at best. And if I regularly dump out good code, you're probably going to be like, oh, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Right. And that's what the solar winds guys were doing. Right. They, they would like write lot of code. So you're like less likely to actually scrutinize it. OK, all of that to get to the point where the DOJ discovers it. They do an investigation and then they're like, oh, no, we feel good about it. Like to me, the story is a little lopsided because it, it, it's given the indication that like there was this like massive investigation and DOJ put the full force of um the United States government and Mandian, who's well known. I know they're owned by uh, Google now, but Mandian is like the top tier 
um, incident response company, right? Like if you think of like what Barricade does, Mandiant does the same thing, except um, they're just bigger. And then Microsoft, we all know Microsoft, right? So you've got these massive juggernauts putting all their resources into it and they can't find anything, which again, this is what I think it's lopsided. Uh, and then they go ahead and purchase SolarWinds anyways. Part of me part of me thinks two things here, okay? And again, uh, thank you for it. Uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Thank you for indulging me as I flip out on this particular story. Two things. One, it makes me wonder if um, whoever, like the information security officer of the DOJ, whoever was, uh, in well, probably the CIO, of the DOJ was making the decisions on whether to make SolarWinds part of their info stack or IT stack or not, because SolarWinds, very expensive, um, very integrated across an entire enterprise. The CIO would definitely be involved in that decision. But it makes me wonder if, and I, I mean this, I don't know who this person is, and I this is I'm based on just this story alone, so it's not a fair assessment, but I wonder if the person who was in charge of like InfoSec there is incompetent where they're like, oh, no, it's it's all right. Let's just go. And the other thing, tinfoil hat Jerry comes into play. The only other thing I can think of is like, oh, like, you know, whoever the uh, signing authority was at the DOJ probably played around a golf with like the CEO of SolarWinds over at Kiowa Island pro golf uh, course, right? Or they had uh, crackers and cheese at the Masters on a four-day Masters trip or something like that, right? Like, again... I'm not saying that happened. I'm just saying a lot of this, like, you know, I don't know. You, you you see what I'm saying, right? Like, oh, no, like, I know we investigated that thing. Nothing really came of it. You're my man, SolarWinds. You're my boy, Blue. So anyways, uh, that is a little tinfoil hat, but I've seen business happen this way so many times. Um, and at this level, I mean, the, the contract, guys, how much do you think the contract was for the SolarWinds DOJ gig, right? Like, I'm just, I'm just gonna, I'm just curious, right? I'm sure it wasn't nothing, right? DOJ SolarWinds contract. I'm just curious, right? Let's see if we can get a quick number. Um, SolarWinds agrees to pay $26 million in settlement. No, no, no. All right, so this news story is kind of squishing everything. So it's really hard to uh, get it, but I bet you anything, there was a, a significant amount of money uh, that exchanged hands during this thing. So SolarWinds obviously didn't want it to go anywhere. Storage giant Americold outage caused by network breach. Representatives from the cold storage and logistics company said they have been facing IT issues since their network was breached on Tuesday night. They confirmed that the <laughs> attack has been contained, that they are now investigating the incident that also affected operations, but that their systems will be down until at least next week. This is according to a memo seen by Bleeping Computer and sent to customers. The company has asked customers to cancel all inbound deliveries past next week and to reschedule all but the most critical outbounds reaching expiration dates. And if all right. First of all, um, simply like if you were at RSA and you couldn't be here uh, last week, I see Kimberly in here, a couple of other you I saw at RSA. Welcome back. I hope you had a good trip over there uh, in San Francisco. Also, you guys are hilarious. Uh, William Welch with the old school reference, uh, Justin with the uh, Austin Powers reference. It's so good. All right, BSEC, you're on deck here, buddy. We got a logistics situation here. Guys, a lot, a lot, a lot of, at least in the United States, product gets moved on tractor trailers, okay? Aaron KG knows what's up. Logistics is a pretty serious business. Now, whether you're moving a bunch of, you know, country hams or you're moving uh, medicine that needs to stay cold. There's logistics for it, right? These Americold things, but like if the, if the trucks don't know where they're going, if there's an, you know, it outages and stuff like that, you don't know where products going. You don't know what uh, temperature to keep it at, et cetera. Uh, you could have some serious issues, right? People could not get their medicine. Um, you know, the actual business could lose a lot of product, um, reputational damage, like, Oh, we're not going to use Americold anymore. Cause whenever we ship with them, they, that our product expires and we can't sell it. So there's some serious impact. I, I feel like logistics and, and trucking is just like accepted as like a commodity. Like, oh yeah, that just it just happens, but it doesn't, right? There's a lot to it. Um, they suffered a computer uh, network outage, it sounds like. Um, 
I had to guess, this looks like ransomware, right? Um, inbound and outbound uh, shipping was canceled. So they basically just ceased operations until they figured out what the hell. Uh, what the heck is going on? Sorry, Kennedy. Kennedy is, as far as I know, our youngest uh, viewer here on uh, Simply Cyber. So I do try to keep it in mind as I speak that um, Kennedy's here. Um, see, they have an official uh, offered an official statement. They say they have it contained. Dude, all day, every day, this is a ransomware attack, right? And uh, I hope I hope for the best that they are um, getting back on board. You got to remember, guys. Um, It was an incident, not a breach. Thank you, Joel Valton. That's right. Don't call the insurance. Don't call the lawyers yet. It's just an incident. Um, here's the deal, y'all. Um, when you get ransomware, I don't care if you're shipping, if you're a hospital, if you're a yacht company, you know, like for the Solar Winds Group. You are, you, like, you lose basic, fundamental computing capabilities, like. You could not be able to send email. You could not be able to boot up your computer. You could not, I mean, you could boot it up. You're just going to get a ransom message, right? You can, you might not be able to do payroll. Depending on how um, dependent you are on apps in your environment, how dependent you are on, um, you know, your file servers or like the data inside your environment, um, you could be hosed, guys. Even if you keep your stuff in the cloud, right? If, if your workforce's machines get ransomware in one brilliant concert, y y people can't work, right? And by the way, um, spinning up, like, oh no, we'll just re-image the machine. If you're gonna re-image 8,000 machines, good luck, buddy. That doesn't take zero minutes. So just whatever, I feel for these people, this is why ransomware is a blight. Moving on. Say he sees significant Russian intel gathering on European and U.S. supply chain entities. Russian hackers are focused on using ransomware to attack supply chains both within Ukraine and in European countries being yes. used to provide weapons and humanitarian Cyber. aid in support of the Ukrainian war effort. And as the war drags on, they could be looking to attack logistics targets more broadly, including in the United States, said Rob Joyce, the NSA's director of cybersecurity, during a briefing at the RSA conference. The NSA is seeing a, quote, significant amount of intelligence gathering into Western countries to include the U.S. in that logistics supply chain, adding that there are no indications yet that any U.S. companies have been attacked with ransomware in connection with logistics related to Ukraine. Wow. OK, so a couple things here. One, John P. says that Admiral Mike Rogers said in a talk that cyber resilience should be the focus. Guys, I've been on that train for about two years now. Cybersecurity is spelt cyber resilience, and I will go to the grave believing that. I, it's just, it's not catchy enough. Splunk's already got the t shirts made up. So, you know, it doesn't, it, like, no one's going to buy into the cyber resiliency term. Um, <clears throat> NSA, you know, our, our friends up, up in the uh, Maryland area are seeing significant Russian intel gathering. Okay. If the NSA is saying the word significant, you better believe that they're <laughs> that they're playing it down. It's probably massive amount of Russian intel, and this is coming hot on the heels of this supply chain uh, incident, which I suspect will be ransomware. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a hot take right here. Hot take. Spec. Uh, this is a a guess. Okay. I believe if we ever cover it again, this Americold story is gonna turn out to be a um, ransomware as a service affiliate issue. So Lockbit think Lockbit um, or Klopp, if I had to guess, okay? That's what's going to happen here. Now, with this right here, Russia is basically trying to identify... This is pretty strategic, by the way. Russia is trying to identify key players in a supply chain. Um, basically, I, I would assume, so then they can make very surgical strikes on key players in the supply chain to disrupt... Uh, operations, uh, disrupt, you know, resupply, uh, possibly even intercept and compromise the integrity uh, in the supply chain. So there's two attacks, right? So like, like, let's make it simple. Like, let's say that food and blankets are being sent to Ukrainian war front and they're coming from different places in the United States. Okay. Food and blankets. Okay. Now, there's two kind of choices when you do a supply chain attack. One, you can 
ransomware, the the you know the blanket manufacturer or the the or the Americold food transportation place, and the food or the blankets do not get to Ukraine. This is like a denial of service attack on the supply chain. Pretty common, right? Easy to wrap our head around. Also, don't sleep on the fact that you can do an integrity attack on these type of things. So the food's coming in, the blankets are coming in, and you intercept and you kind of uh, mess with it. So, you know, the blankets get put in the same um, shipping container as uh, a shipment of moths, right? And the moths kind of eat and, and, and screw up the uh, the blankets, right? Or the food, uh, you know, you change, um, you compromise the integrity and you, and you, you make the truck uh, warm, not cold, and all the food perishes on the way. Again, it's still a denial of service attack, but you don't know until the food gets to where it's going that it's screwed, right? So this introduces lag. Um, you know, if, if when you're moving troops and everything, there's a lot of moving parts. It's not like, you know, five guys moving forward 30 feet. It's like entire factions of people, squads, right? Moving into key uh, areas. So you have to feed them. You have to provide them with the resources that they need. Uh, how do you get them there? A million different things, right? So th to me, this is why Russia is doing this. It's, it's so they can identify key critical elements of a complicated supply chain in order to do surgical strikes on that supply chain, if I had to guess. Also, um, one other thing. One other thing that uh, is worth pointing out is that there is information that can come out of knowing what the supply chain is, right? So <clears throat> I talked about a denial of service availability attack. I talked about an integrity attack. Also, if you are tapped into the supply chain and you see, you know, 5,000 pounds of MREs or meals ready to eat and 6,000 blankets being shipped to... Um, Kurzak, right, or or to Kiev, right, and the, or, you know, like or Kharkov, like, and there's no troops there right now. You can make the indication that, like, holy crap, there's a bunch of supplies going to Kharkov. I would assume that some, you know, military force is going to be going to Kharkov as well. So you have that information. So now you can make more informed decisions, right? Again, these are all kind of hypothetical things I'm making up um, to to illustrate my point. But my point is. Just hacking supply chain isn't just about like, you know, being hacker man and being in the matrix and everything. There's a lot of value to gleam from hacking uh, up and down the supply chain. All right. Hopefully that that's useful for people. And now a it's word not from good. our sponsor, that's, Trend it's Micro. Not good. Cybersecurity is not just about protection. It's about foresight, agility and resilience. Navigating a new era of cyber risk demands evolved strategies, new frameworks, and integrated tools to equip security teams to anticipate and defend against even the most advanced attacks. Trend Micro, the global leader in cybersecurity, is bringing the cyber risk conversation to more than 120 cities around the world in their latest Risk to Resilience World Tour, the largest cybersecurity roadshow of its kind. Find the closest city to you and register today to take a leap forwards towards a more resilient future. Head to trendmicro.com slash CISO series. All right, it's the mid-roll. And we know, you know what we do here at the mid-roll, y'all. Hey, 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 hey. All right, guys, I want to take a hot minute and thank you all for being here. We got those numbers up. Uh, those aren't rookie numbers. 273 of you here live with us today. Great to have you here on a Monday morning. I know it can be tough to get the motor going on a Monday, but you guys are here and we're crushing it. Thank you to the stream sponsors, Barricade Cyber and Panops. I definitely appreciate what you're doing. Also want to say holla, holla, holla to XM Cyber. XM Cyber, another stream sponsor. Really appreciate what they're doing. Guys, organizations, your organization potentially, are overwhelmed with thousands of exposures across, not just on-premise, but also in your cloud environments. And it's on a, non a monthly basis, guys. So officially reducing risk is basically impossible, right? Like it's super, super hard. You can get um, remediation fatigue. You can get apathetic of like, oh, what's the point? We just saw that Veeam backup uh, exposed compromise happening, right? So you've got to be vigilant. But what you need is to discover the most critical threats and practical tips on how to actually uh, address risk reduction in your environment in a pragmatic, 
you know, valuable way. And you can use approaches um, that are efficient, you know, that there's different approaches you can use uh, to reduce risk, but go check out XM Cyber's 2023 State of Exposure Management Report. There's a link in the description below. It would, it would, it would be huge if you just go down, click the link, get the report, take a look at it. it. It doesn't cost anything to download the report. This is what it looks like. If you're old school like me, you print it out and then read it and then highlight the crap out of it. But uh, it it goes into all about like what exposure management is, and then it actually has some like really interesting statistics. You guys know I'm sucker for infographics, so uh, <laughs> they got plenty of those. Thank you, XM Cyber, for the um, for the support. All right, guys, if you got your newsletter this morning, you know what's going on. If you don't know what I'm talking about, every single Monday morning, I send a newsletter out that I write, and it to me, it delivers real value. It's not this bold newsletter of like stuff you don't care about. It's three pieces of actionable intel, one for your end users, one for your peers, one for your executives. If you don't like it, unsubscribe. If you do like it, tell a friend. Um, thank you, Josh Mason. Uh, go to simplycyber.io slash newsletter or exclamation point newsletter in chat, I think works still. And um, sign up. And if you don't like it, unsubscribe. I'm completely cool with unsubscribing. Simple as that. Also, if you're on that newsletter chain, you're going to be getting all the emails for Simply CyberCon because that's what we're going to be using. Look at all this membership love. Thank you so much. All right, guys, Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Matthew Necci currently holds the baton. If Matthew Necci's here, I would genuinely appreciate that he tags somebody. Uh, every single every single weekday, we do the Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Someone ta like Matthew Necci did it on Friday. He will tag somebody now. And um, good luck, K. Scott Powell on that CISA Plus. You got that. Um, Matthew Necci tags someone. Go online if you get tagged. Post in LinkedIn, hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Share your cyber story. Let us know what motivates you, what drives you, what are you doing. And use hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge in the uh, post. Mark Lauterbeck has got it. Love it, love it, love it. Hey, Mark. So if Mark accepts, uh, Mark will post. And guys, everybody go out and tag connect with Mark and then the people commenting. This is a mechanism to allow you to grow your professional network in a meaningful way instead of a bunch of like random strangers. Hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. I'm very proud of it. I love what it's done. If you have gotten value from the Simply Cyber Community Challenge, please let me know in chat. I'd love to hear your stories. All right, final thing is Callan's Art of the Week. Now Callan typically does art uh, but he didn't do it this weekend. We we had like a, a crazy weekend here at the um, at the home. So he didn't do any art this weekend. God bless him. But uh, I do want to share one thing with you. I don't have any affiliate uh, relationship with this, but I do love it. Hero Complex Gallery. I don't know if you guys have heard of this. Um, I'll drop a link in, in chat on YouTube. Hero Complex Gallery. They They really just like... I don't know, man. They have like really cool art. Like it's just a lot of it's like Hollywood related. But if you've got something you like, they do Pokemon stuff. Like, you know, like here's Big Lebowski, right? Jeff Daniel. Like it's just, it's just so cool uh, to me. I, I've only, I've never bought anything from here because I don't have a cool place to put it. Maybe maybe in the bungalow mainframe, I will have somewhere to put it. Uh, so you might see some artwork there. But I just wanted to share this with you because. To me, um, it's a really cool website. You can easily spend a few minutes uh, getting lost in this website, all right? Hero Complex Gallery. All right, let's get back into the news. Oh, yes. And, uh, oh, yeah, I forgot. Um, if you are, um, if you missed last week because you were at RSA, on <laughs> on uh, Friday, I, I made a, a, like I just quickly said, like Flaming Donkey is a threat actor, not thinking about it. And then we ended up making some artwork of the Flaming Donkey. And if you were on LinkedIn, I actually did. Um, I, I, I made a post and asked people to make up uh, threat actor names. And then I did a bunch of, uh, <laughs> I did a bunch of mid journey art on it. It was a good time. Um, so Flaming Donkey, watch out for them. They're, the, they're, they're quite... 
They're quite the ass. Zyso firewall devices vulnerable to remote code execution attacks. So patch now. Networking equipment maker Zycel has released patches for a critical security flaw in its firewall devices that could be exploited to achieve remote code execution on affected systems. The issue, tracked as CVE 2023-28771, is rated 9.8 on the CVSS scoring system. Researchers from Trappa Security have been credited with reporting the flaw. Quote, improper error message handling in some firewall versions could allow an unauthenticated attacker to execute some OS commands remotely by sending crafted packets to an affected device, as Zycel said in an advisory on April 25th. Products impacted by the flaw are versions of ATP, USG Flex, VPN, and Zywall USG. For okay, so really quickly, uh, he said Zyxel. I call it Zyxel. Um... Zixel to me is like in the same category as QNAP. Um, and if you are a regular um, practitioner who stays on WhatsApp, you know, you know that QNAP is basically uh, just constantly getting uh, embarrassed with security vulnerabilities. Uh, so Zixel Firewall, guys, here's the deal. 9.8 CVE score is not good. Remote code execution, arbitrary remote code execution, unauthenticated is the worst. That's literally the worst combination you can have. It means anyone on the internet without doing anything to authenticate can execute anything on your box. Like that's, I mean, it's, grab your ankles because <laughs> it's not going to be good. All right, guys. So that's why the actual title says patch now. Um, it, it, it it, it's a firewall. It's a piece of security technology. It's not a network attached storage device that happens to be vulnerable. It's a piece of security technology that is wicked vulnerable. If you're running a Zixel firewall, this is an absolute pause the show, become time, become team hybrid and go fix this. Okay. Hopefully you already know about this. Um, also, I mean, realistically, hopefully you have decent logging. You should probably verify whether or not um, malicious traffic has already occurred through that firewall. If this remote code, whatever, in the, I'm sure in the write-up or in uh, if you follow the links to Zixel, they probably have indicators of compromise, things you can look for that would indicate that your machine has been compromised uh, and it has been exploited. So look for those. Uh, but this isn't good. And, you know... I can't I can't be too hard on Zixel, but to me, like I don't think of Zixel as commercial grade product, right? Like Fortinet, uh, Meraki, Cisco, Palo Alto, Aruba. These are commercial grade, enterprise grade, like uh, technologies. Zixel, you know, with all due respect, I do not. I count them as like, you know, uh, lower tier. You know, and you pay less for them, right? Which is part of the reason why people would buy them or use them. But if you're like a small business and, and you know, you're, you've got Zixel firewalls or something like that, you're not hiding in the noise. I told you already, Shodan, Shodan knows. If you're running a vulnerable version of the Zixel firewall exposed to the internet, Shodan already knows. Threat actors can go look it up and find you and pop your box. Pop, 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 pop your box, right? So patch it i'll see you later team hybrid come back after you patch first draft of controversial un cybercrime treaty slated for june the first draft of this treaty will be released in june after years of debate and concern over what the document might cover the un general assembly voted in december 2019 to begin negotiating a treaty centered around cybercrime after russia took issue with a previous agreement the budapest convention and demanded something new to address the issue Jane Lee, Senior Counsel for Computer Crime and Intellectual Property at the U.S. Justice Department, said at the RSA conference on Thursday that she had just returned from the fifth negotiating session in Vienna, explaining that progress was made on an initial draft that will be released on June 28th. South Carolina... All right, hold on one second. Uh, ooh, the next story has something to do with South Carolina. That's fun. Um, okay, so I'm just looking here... Um... Okay, so cybercrime treaty 
the United Nations is trying to do this. Um, and it's, it says controversial. I, I didn't, I was actually kind of texting with, um, not texting, like mod chatting over here for a second. And, and, and I kind of missed like what the juice of this story was, but I can just tell you something that you should know at the macro level. All right. Let me show you this book here. I read this book. Dry, dry book. Very, very valuable though. Okay. This book right here, Russian Cyber Ops by Scott Jasp. Hold on. Get out of here. Russian Cyber Ops by Scott. J I just want to see the book cover. Why can't I see the book cover? Oh my God, bro. Killing me. Okay. Russian Cyber Ops. Okay. This book is dry, but it is excellent. I have read it. Russia is obviously doing all sorts of cyber related operations. We just heard a story that the NSA has seen significant Russian intel gathering on, you know, basically Five Eyes supply chain, okay? So it, this is not a theory, this is a fact. Now, the United Nations is where the world countries get together, first world powers get together, and they make rules around international norms, international behaviors, okay? And it gets very geopolitical, but here's the deal. Russia does go to the UN. Russia does behave at the UN like they're not committing all this cyber espionage. Also, you've got to remember, they're defining international norms, and the US is committing cyber espionage just as much as Russia, right? So don't think that we're, um, you know, got the halo up over here and we're just chilling. Read Nicole Pelroth's, this is how they tell me the world ends and that will answer all your things. But this book here actually goes into great detail to talk about how Russia on the regular will go to the UN and they'll, they'll say all the right things, right? So um, I, I bet you for this cybercrime treaty, Russia saying all the things that you'd want them to hear. And then when it comes time to like vote on it or, or everybody sign it, Russia's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, I think there's something here that we need to reevaluate. Like basically just like stirring the pot. If you've ever worked at a company that's like fat with bureaucracy or too many, you know, cooks in the kitchen, if you've ever heard of that, um, they, it, they, according to this book, they, they kind of intentionally do that to, delay, delay, delay to mix up and, and make things difficult. And they do it with like almost British, um, almost like British, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, oh my God, like British decorum, where you can't say like, oh, you're, you're wasting everybody's time because they're doing it in a way that like, pro pro like projects good faith. But anyways, I, if I had to guess, when I read this story, everything in this book immediately comes to mind. So I'm not surprised that this cybercrime treaty is being kind of mucked up by Russia, who, by the way, is a front runner in committing cybercrime. Um, so anyways, uh, also very interesting um, about this is getting into um, international definitions of war, acts of war, right? Russia turned off the power in Ukraine in 2014, right? Just to show they could. Is that an act of war? Some people would argue it is. Dude, the United States and Israel basically destroyed a uranium enrichment plant in Iran. Is that an act of war? Many people would think it is, right? If we flew over and dropped, <laughs> dropped kinetic munitions on that plant... That sure would be considered an act of war. So it gets really complicated uh, because for the most part, no country really wants to start having a actual cyber war uh, because of the machinations and, and, and the machine that starts rolling once you actually enter uh, a state of war. So anyways, uh, just a shout out to the Scott Jasper book. If you're looking for a, a book that will challenge your ability to stay awake while you read, but it is fascinating once you get through the, uh, the first half of it. County government hit with ransomware attack. The South Carolina county of Spartanburg is dealing with a ransomware attack that has limited its IT and phone no, systems. Spartanburg. In a statement to Recorded Future News, Spartanburg County spokesperson Kay Blackwell said officials recently discovered the ransomware and are in the process of responding to the incident. 
Blackwell confirmed that all essential services continue to operate, including 911 operations and emergency communications. And now- oh, man, tough bead, Spartanburg. They're in the upstate. I live in the low country, so these are our, our, our brethren in the upstate. But Spartanburg's fairly good-sized um, county. I think Greenville's in Spartanburg, if I'm not mistaken, which is... Um, Joel Belton. Uh, Anyways, this is not the first um, local government to get hit. You can see here, Oakland got hit recently. Um, Modesto, California, which I didn't even know about. Oakland was like really all over the news a little while ago. New Jersey, Colorado, Oregon, New York. uh, Just local governments getting hit. It's all the same, guys. Local governments are grossly underfunded. Okay? They don't they don't have infosec staff typically. They'll have IT, and then the IT people will be expected to do infosec stuff. They're not running. They might have EDRs, but they're not running sec ops typically. Okay, they're not doing. Um, they don't have SOC analysts looking over sims and getting alerts and doing detection engineering and crap like that. They're just sitting there with, you know, <laughs> basically not wearing pants with the lights turned off, hoping nobody turns the lights on. And unfortunately, threat actors know it, and they they juice the grid and light up all the lights. Um, so uh, one nice thing, and you see this with 100% uh, consistency, they do say that all essential services continue to operate, specifically 911. Usually 911 is on a separate dedicated system anyways, uh, literally for the intention of uh, business continuity and decoupling it from other complicated aspects of, um, you know, local government operations and stuff like that. Hopefully Spartanburg had backups. I don't know if they do. Hopefully, I mean, they don't pay the ransom, but guys, here's the deal. On average, ransomware, on average, you'll be down a week. On average, you'll be down a week. On average, you will pay $560,000 for a ransom, okay? That doesn't count. That doesn't count like um, operational downtime, professional services, hiring people to come in, spending time, uh, pay, you know, if you have to pay people to work on the weekends, buying new hardware, shipping out laptops that work. Like all of the things uh, cost money, y'all. So, I don't know, man. Some pimento cheese and crackers to my friends in Spartanburg. Last week in ransomware. It has been a quiet week for ransomware news with few reports and little new information about cyber attacks being released. But what we did see was Microsoft linking the recent paper cut server attacks on the Clop and Lockbit ransomware operation. An expose on the initial access broker and ransomware affiliate known as Baster Lord. That's B-A-S-S-T-E-R-L-O-R-D a VMware ESXi encryptor for RTM Locker, and Yellow Pages Canada suffering a Black Basta ransomware attack. Damn. We'll be conducting a... Black Basta all up in the business, guys. I don't know if Black Basta is a um, ransomware as a service uh, model, but they definitely hit somebody here in the low country last week that I know of. Uh, guys, you know, the ransomware roundup is exactly what it is. It's the ransomware roundup. Let me do a yeet. <laughs> Uh, nothing too crazy here. Um, I would say, you know, definitely keep be mindful of the ransomware roundup. Pull a story out that has something to do with your industry um, or your area. Something that you can leverage to help um, motivate the people who control the purse strings uh, into giving you resources to be able to um, help not just secure and protect your organization, but recover faster. Um, like I said, uh, I believe this Americold will turn out to be a, you know, lockbit type ransomware as a service threat actor group. Although it could be Russia. We'll see. All right, guys. A couple minutes over. I did. Thank you for indulging me as I lost my mind on the first couple stories. This is Skyline Scroller from Stream Beats by Harris Heller on Spotify if you're looking for it. If you're here just for the news, thank you very much. 245 of you. It looks like 30 people already peeled off. Uh, Have a great Monday. We'll be back tomorrow. Every single day, the 
Daily Cyber Threat Briefing is at 8 a.m. Eastern Time every single weekday morning. Share it with your friends. Tell your fr tell your family and loved ones to come on over here and hang out with us. Thanks, Daniel Neese. Um, Jenny Housley, did, um, did um, Mark Lauterbach accept the challenge or do we need to tag somebody? Let me know. Yeah, if you want to hang out for a minute, I can jaw jack for just a minute. Oh, Angela Wolverton. I, I will take that under advisement. Thank you. I got a new one here. I just bought this one. I haven't got a chance to dig into it. Uh, understand, manage, and measure cyber risk by Ryan Lervik. He was my guest on Simply Cyber uh, Live last Thursday. And uh, we talked about this book. I ordered it right after the stream. And uh, I'm looking forward to get into it. This looks like a, uh, a playbook on how to run an information security program in an effective way. All right, Mark Lauterbach accepting. Make sure uh, you put the Simply Cyber Community Challenge hashtag in your post on LinkedIn, Mark. And everybody go read Mark's post and connect with him and everybody in the comments. Uh, Abdullah says he's planning for OSCP. I was wondering which plan do I pick, the ultimate or the basic? Um, I don't, Abdullah, ultimate or basic plan for what? I don't, I'm, I'm confused about that. Oh, Cybersecurity Central has a book list. That's good. Maybe I can contribute to that one. Kimberly, if instead of having like a Simply Cyber book list, maybe I can just be a contributor um, into that. Uh, what, Leroy, this book right here is called uh, Understand... Where is it? Understand, Manage, and Measure Cyber Risk by Ryan Lervik. You can get it on uh, Amazon. I think it's like 30 bucks. And the book before that I was talking about is Russian Cyber Operations by Scott Jasper. Now, this book is a few years old. This book, The Russian Cyber Ops, is probably like two years old now. But it's still relevant, I mean. All right, John De La Cruz, be good. Anyone who's a cyber technical bookworm, O'Reilly has a sub if you read ebooks. Okay, cool, cool. Oh, cool. Thanks, Kimberly. So there'll be a Jerry's list over at Cybersecurity Central, a, um, a simple, maybe call it simply cyber. Is there a way to learn hands on RSA Archer? Not that I'm aware of. R if, for those who don't know, RSA Archer is like a massive enterprise application. Um, that can allow you to do like policy management and procedures and, and workflows. Personally, I thought RSA Archer was a terrible application, Patrick. Just so you know, I, obviously you want to... Oh, um, hold on. So if you're wondering about ACI Learning, uh, I'll put a link in chat. Simply Cyber 30. Simply Cyber 30 is the coupon code at IT Pro TV. Um, excuse me, IT Pro TV. Formerly IT Pro TV, now ACI Learning. Use the code Simply Cyber 30 in chat. However, if you are a veteran and I think first responder, you can get 60% off. So even though I would love you to use my affiliate code because it helps <laughs> support me, um, I would be more prefer. Given the choice between supporting me with an affiliate fee or you getting an additional 30% off, I take you getting an additional 30% off all day, every day. All right. Okay. All right. We are at time. Hopefully, guys, I'm supposed to have a electrician come by today and get the uh, the, the 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 mainframe bungalow back on schedule. We're, we're kind of at a a pause right now until I can get a, an electrician in here. Oh, thank you, Pursuit of Bliss. Nice. The book list, Steve, is at Cybersecurity Central. All right. Yeah, Shed Office. That's what I'm talking about, Cyber Andy. So the, sh the, the Shed, which I'm like kind of playing with names, it's like the mainframe bungalow. It's all, it's all wired, but it's not the power from my house or the power from the street is not connected into the facility yet and that's the piece that i need someone to do i need an electrician to put a new um sub amp on, um panel on the side of my house and run power uh so that's where that is i've got insulation i've got drywall um i've got flooring i, I just need the electrician 
I can't do anything until the electrician. So unfortunately, I think what's going to end up happening is um, I'm going to wrap the uh, the bungalow and then immediately go um, remote for five weeks. So we keep going. We keep we keep trying here. All right, guys, I appreciate all of you. 200 of you still here on the jaw jacking. Have a great Monday. I will be playing uh, World of Haiku later today. I should have mentioned that. I always forget things, but I'll be playing World of Haiku later today. So if you want to come hang out for a live Let's Play, um, that'll be at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Also, holy crap, like, dude, so many things I forget to tell you, like, share with you guys. We hit 60,000 subs last Friday, guys. So, um... Thank you all very much for being part of the 60,000. Thank you for allowing me into your into your life, into your professional uh, situation. And uh, we're doing good things over here at Simply Cyber, trying to help people. So I'm certainly an advocate, certainly a fan. All right. I have got to get out of here. Be good, everybody. We will see you today at 4 p.m. or tomorrow for the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. Be good, everybody. Share it with a friend. Thanks for all the love and support, guys. Take care. We'll see you tomorrow or later today.